God is good and his love endures forever. It's good to be gathered together as his people tonight uh, to sing his praises, to hear from, from the one who has given us everything, who's given us life, who's given us breath, who's given us redemption and hope. And uh, as we begin uh, this evening, I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we begin with a, a reading from Scripture. So if you would stand, and we're going to read together tonight. Uh, we're going to read uh, from the Psalms, Psalm 145, as we begin. Um, again, to focus our hearts, our minds as one body, to lift up in this moment uh, our hearts and minds and voices as one. And so... Uh, if you will, read with me together, uh, starting at the I. We skip the first couple parts there. Starting at the I, Psalm 145, verses 1 through 7. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you, for you are indeed good. There is no one like you. There is no one who is perfect and holy, and from, from whom everything that comes from, from, comes from is good. God, we are grateful that we worship a God who is like you, who knows no evil, who knows no um, uh, temptation or, or suffering, um, God, we thank you for, for coming and enduring what you have endured, becoming, in, becoming one of us, living among us, living as us, dying for us, going to the cross, going to the grave, and rising again so that we could have hope. We come together tonight to sing your praises and to say that great is the Lord and most worthy of praise are you. So God, we pray as we lift up our hearts, our minds, our voices to you as one, we pray that you would speak to us. We pray that you would make our, our ears, our minds, our hearts, our bodies receptive to what you want to say to us tonight, Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would shape us into your, more and more into your image so we can reflect you in all that we do. So thank you for this opportunity to gather together. We praise you and bless you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.
Good evening. It's good to see you, whether you're here with us live or you're watching online later on. As always, it's a privilege to gather together in the name of Christ to open up his word, to learn about him, to worship him, to praise him, to share with each other in community and in fellowship, to do all the things that we who call ourselves Christians are encouraged to do, called to do, blessed to be able to do. And we don't take that for granted. So again, wonderful to see you that you would join us. We are studying through the book of Exodus. And we are sort of in the midst of that all familiar story for a lot of us of God dealing with Pharaoh, dealing with the country and the kingdom of Egypt, Moses, and, and, and kind of like the, the messenger and the intermediary for God and Pharaoh, the signs and the wonders. Sometimes they're called plagues, but they're not technically plagues, but the signs and the wonders of God. And out of all the things that get, because we've, we've talked about this before, whenever God is doing something, there's many reasons why he's doing it, many layers as to his actions. Um, but we've talked about the fact that when God does signs like this, the things that he's doing in the, in, for the view of, of Israel, of Pharaoh, of the Egyptians, of everybody, these signs and these wonders, these supernatural things, the reason he's doing them is so that people ultimately everywhere will come to know him better who he is his power his authority what he's about and that that will t want them to turn to him in devotion and fellowship and relationship he wants to be known so that people will be in relationship with him well another thing that i think starts to reveal itself another purpose that we could see if that's one of the purposes one of the many because there's also the fulfillment of promises to the to the fathers of israel to Abraham, Isaac, and everybody, and the idea of them being free from slavery. So again, there's many layers, but another lesson, something else that I feel God is trying to communicate to everybody, wanting everybody that's witnessing this and will hear about this to see and to know, is the idea that what God desires, God is going to have. That there is nothing that can stand in, in the way of God's will. And now again, for some of us, if we've grown up in the church or we've been tracking along or we this is our faith and our belief, we kind of nod to those things, right? We hear them and we go, yeah, I got it. Yeah, that sounds pretty basic. If God is God, if he is the Lord, all caps, Adonai, if he is the one doing this miraculous wonders and signs, and yeah, we, we, we get this. But there's a, there's a prevailing truth in this statement, and that is the idea that what God is trying to reveal by the signs he is doing is that there is nothing beyond his reach. And if he is telling Pharaoh, let my people go, if he is reminding Moses and the Israelites, Pharaoh will eventually not just let you go, but he will usher you out by my mighty hand. He is demonstrating, and there is nothing, no, no, no hardened hearts, no army, no anything that's going to deter God's plan. What God wants, what God wills, what God desires is going to happen. Now, we may say that in our life, or we may look in scripture and put ourselves in the shoes of some of the individuals in the story, and it may seem like, well, that's not always the case, or it certainly seems like it takes a while, or we may have our objections, our frustrations, but ultimately the truth that God is wanting to communicate, one of the things he's trying to say is that what I desire, what I want is going to happen. I want you to hold on to that, that idea, that, that promise. And I want you to even start, and even as I'm talking, just start thinking prayerfully, kind of considering, do I believe that to be true? Do I see that in my life? Do I trust? Do I live like that's true? Because God is trying to, again, through these signs and wonders, communicate something about himself. We're going to be looking at a, another big section of scripture. So we're looking at Exodus 8, verse 20, through chapter 10. Verse 29, and basically we're, we're, we're summarizing, because it is a summary, summarizing and touching on the rest of the signs and wonders. We looked at the first three and kind of the idea of what God was doing there and some of the purposes, and we're, we're following up in that. And, it's, and again, the idea is that God is going to do what he wants to do and nothing's going to get in his way. But there's an aspect to that as we look at the signs and wonders that we maybe want to glean from. And that is that it's not just that he's going to do it. It's not just that he's going to make himself known. It's how he's going to do it. He's going to make himself known out of the many attributes of God through his extraordinary power 
and his extraordinary grace. Power in terms of the signs that he is accomplishing and doing are not the norm. There have been many studies, many teachings, many books, many things written about how the signs and wonders from Exodus could have been natural phenomena or they could have happened um, within the order of nature and everything else and the, the, trying to diminish the extraordinary supernatural nature of them. And there's debate on that, but I, wherever you land on that, I think one of the important things that some scholars land on is the idea that whether they could have been done naturally or whether they were supernatural, the most important thing is the catalyst that set them to happen was God. It was the power of God that turned the water, the power of God that brought the frogs, the power of God that turned the sand into bugs. It's, it was always the power of God. By his authority above anybody else, above anything else, him deciding this is what's going to happen, and it happened. But in this story, we're also going to be reminded of God's grace. And that's a, that's a funny word to think about when you think about the Exodus story and the signs and wonder, and when we know what the last sign in, 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 in evidence of God's power is, if we know the story. The word grace, the idea of grace, doesn't seem to always fit. And we'll get to that. But again, when we're thinking about the signs and wonders in these few chapters, just to remind you, we're talking about the flies or mosquitoes, depending on which scholars or which interpretation you're about. The flies and mosquitoes, the death of the livestock, the boils on all people, like the, the, the boils on their skin, the hail falling from heaven, the locusts eating and covering everything, and then the darkness that covered the land. And in all of these, we see the familiar pattern. Moses, God through Moses, saying, let my people go. And there's slight progressions in Pharaoh's response. He starts kind of trying to bargain. I'll let them do this, or only let this group of people, only the men, or not the kids, or not the, well, they can only go this far, not that far. Well, they can only, they have to come back. He starts kind of bargaining. But ultimately, whether he succumbs to the moment and says, fine, fine, I'll let them go if you stop this sign. Or whether he just certainly doesn't even get to that point in all of these things. Either we read that his heart became hardened or that God hardened his heart. And again, we, we mentioned that in that it is not forcing, it is not God forcing Pharaoh to act against his will and desire. It is more allowing Pharaoh to act upon that which he has chosen. But we see the pattern of God speaking. He says, no, the sign comes. Pharaoh then responds. In some degree, the sign is taken away, but Pharaoh reneges or just chooses to stubbornly not let go. And it's God continuing to say, Pharaoh, let my people go. Know that I am God. Know that I am above all your other gods. Know that I am above even you, your authority. And let my people go. See, the, we've talked about the idea of how the signs and wonders in Exodus are a way of God making himself known. But it also means that it's, a, it's an opportunity for everybody that is witnessing them, everybody that's going through them, to then have to make an informed decision and respond to what they are seeing. As we become aware of God, of his call, of his presence, of his works, all of us then have to choose how to respond. Have you ever thought about that? All of us, I'm assuming at one point or another, have called out to God or have needed God. Or have prayed for somebody that needs God or needs an intervention. And all of us, I, I, I want to believe, and if not, that's fine, but I want to believe a lot of us have witnessed things that happen that we can directly say, that was God intervening. That's a God blessing. God intervened on my behalf, on your behalf. He sustained, He strengthened, He provided, He blessed. All of us at one point had an idea of who God was. 
And something happened, a sign, a wonder, a testimony, a movement of the Spirit, an event, a song, a teaching, a conversation. Something happened that, in one way or another, revealed more of who God is, what God is like, or maybe even at some point that God actually was even there. And upon that knowledge, upon that realization, upon that evidence or that event, all of us have to make the choice of how to then respond to that. Do we lean in and pursue more? Do we ask more questions? Do we show up at church? Do we talk to our uh, friend who's a believer? If you're sitting here at church or if you're watching this, then you must have at some point again responded to some kind of sign to something in your life that led you at least to the point of being willing to listen and check it out. God does not do things simply to do them. God has a God of purpose and order. God is a God of planning. God is a God of, of God is a, the God that designed everything intricately and, and, and preciously. When he does things, it's not just that he does them for anything. In fact, he does them for, like we said, multiple layers. So when he does something in your life, when you are a witness to something in your life, in your friend's life, in your church's life, in your community's life, when you see the hand of God, when you are left with the impression that has to have been God, that is something beyond us, we are to respond. And God, in acting in this way for Israel in the face of Pharaoh and the Egyptians, is asking them to respond. He is demonstrating his power by the fact that he's doing things that even his magicians ultimately couldn't replicate perfectly or couldn't do or stop. He is showing his grace in the fact that there's even multiple signs and wonders. Have you ever thought about that? The God of the universe, the Lord, all caps, Adonai, has said, I want my people free. And we know, and God is trying to demonstrate, what I want, I will have. So why all these signs? Why not roll in a whole bunch of, like, angel army people, you know, like, just... I'm sure, I'm sure something could have been worked out. He's got a couple of them, or a few of them, standing, you know, guarding the garden. We read about that in Genesis. He's got, he's got the forces. He's got the, the might and the power. Maybe not even just angel armies. Just show up in his presence and declare, let them go right this moment. I find that interesting because when we read in the New Testament, it reminds me of how Jesus never forced his presence, never forced his title, never forced his authority, really, on anybody around. He was God, fully God, all authority. And he spoke as God, with authority. But he allowed people to walk away from him. He allowed crowds to not believe him. He allowed Pharisees to make jokes or plot. He performed signs. Gospel of John says that he performed many signs so that people will come to know and believe that he was the Lord. But he never forced it. The scriptures say he sends at the door and he knocks. In showing all these multiple signs, what God is doing is he extending grace. He is saying, I am going to give you a chance, then another chance, then another chance, then another chance. We read in the New Testament, God is not slow in keeping his promises, but in fact, he is giving every last moment. He is waiting to like every last moment so that the more people, the most possible, will come to know him and be saved and be spared. God is a God that is slow to anger, that is wanting, longing to forgive, longing for relationship. He's doing this. He's showing these signs in a powerful, terrifying way so that they will know that he is the one true God, but he is also patiently knowing how stubborn they are, continuing to give them chance after chance after chance. I don't know about you, but I know that I probably unfairly 
have benefited from that chance after chance after chance rule probably more than I'd like to admit. I know that when I look at my life, now in my mid-40s, it sounds terrible. <laughs> and I look at some of the things that I will today and tomorrow in my devotions and my prayer time, go to God and pray, God, can you please help me with this? Can you strengthen me, Lord? Can you continue to guide me through this? I know that if I'm honest and humble enough, some of the things I'm praying for now, I prayed for five years ago. Probably even some of them 10 years ago. Not all of them. There's been progress. There's been healing. There's been movement on a lot of them. But if I'm honest, some of them are there. And I get so frustrated. Like, why am I still praying about this? Why is this still an issue? And it is a fact that all of us will have things in our life that we, we just... We need God's help to overcome. We need God's help to lead us through. But we also ultimately need, need and benefit from his grace and his patience. And that in itself is a sign and a wonder from God. As a parent, I'm not always so gracious and patient. As an employee, I've had employers that have not always been that gracious and patient. I had parents that were not always so gracious and patient. As a boyfriend or as a husband, me and my partner or my spouse, we've not always been gracious and patient with each other. We don't always like extending multiple chances. We don't always like, we don't, and it's not easy. But our God is different. God knows you intimately. God knows you better than anybody. And he knows what your struggles are. And he knows what you need to see and what you need to hear to be encouraged. He knows what signs and wonders you need to be reminded of his power and be reminded of his grace. And he continues to call you. He continues to call us. He continues to call the Pharaoh. Let them go. Acknowledge me. Pharaoh, us, everybody has to choose to respond to the signs that we are given. And as we respond, an interesting word came to mind, and that's the word testimony. Now, the de a definition that I found, like a simple like Google, kind of like, how can I just sum it up? The definition was this. A testimony is the sharing or giving a testimony in Christianity is telling someone else about your relationship with God. According to Miriam Webster, a testimony is a solemn declaration usually made by a witness under oath in response to interrogation, lawyer, authorized public official, first hand authentication, an outward sign, a public profession of a religious experience. We all know what a testimony is. We all know the importance of testimony. Have you ever had Somebody tell you something or somebody say, you should get this or you should buy this or you should go here. The food was great. And you go, the food was great. Was it really great? And a lot of us, or at least me, would go, did you eat there? Or, who, or I, I, if I don't trust this person, I'm like, let me ask so-and-so. Hey, did you eat there? What'd you have? Was it good? Ever had the person, I'm going to seek with the food analogy. Ever had the person go, oh, try this. It's really good. I will tell you right now, the testimony, it's really good, is subjective, and I only take it on the basis of other claims the individual handing me the food has made before. And that's the way that we are with everything. Buy this. Well, do I trust what you say about it? Go to this place. Well, have you gone there? And do I find it factual? Can I trust your word? So-and-so said this. So-and-so did that. A parent gets a notice from school that their kid has, that their child has been suspended. Why? What happened? Talk to their child. This, they're saying this happened, but this isn't what happened. Parent has a choice. Do I believe the testimony of my child? Do I believe the school? Could it, there have been some misunderstanding? I need to, I've been given information. I need to respond to it in some way. All throughout scripture, you will find moments, whether the Psalms, whether the Gospels, whether the letters, whether, you will find moments where God's people will proclaim that they are going to testify, that they are going to extol, that they are going to share, they are going to praise and raise their voices 
to the wonder, the good, the power, the grace, the love, the authority, the sovereignty, all things that God has done. They have witnessed, they have experienced, they have gone through something. God has intervened. God has demonstrated himself. God has revealed himself. God has enacted and stepped into. And they've witnessed it, they've seen it, and they feel compelled to share it. The New Testament talks about the idea of always being ready to give a testimony, to share why they believe what they believe. All of us have experienced something. Something along the lines of God's power and of God's grace. And we are called to respond to that. And a way that we can respond is in how we testify. And because this is what this is what scripture says in Psalm 145, verses 10 through 12. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. This song, in some ways, in some direct ways, what you're reading here is what God is trying to accomplish in Exodus. He is trying to act in a way that will make Egypt, Pharaoh, Israel, everybody look upon the works and tell of the glory of his kingdom, speak of his might, so that all people would know the mighty acts and the glorious splendor of God's kingdom. He is trying to make himself known in a powerful and gracious way so that people will turn to him, love him, follow him, and tell others about him. That is what God wants. God does not set out to destroy Egypt. He does not set out to torture Egypt just for the sake of he is trying to make himself known so that people will turn to him. What we see in all these signs, last week's, this week's, and you can go back to the story and remind yourself of just how it took place. What we're seeing is that the story in itself is a testimony of God's power. Meaning that we we're seeing how God's authority, his power, is just unquestionable, it's unmatched. Controlling the sun and the light and the darkness. Controlling the properties of water. Controlling the movements and the swarming of different animals. Bringing death upon livestock. Controlling our very physical bodies. With the boils and everything. Oh, and, and then bringing them and stopping them. That is a power that is unmatched. He's revealing. He is testifying to his power. It's also testifying to his graciousness. Because again, like we said, it's displayed in his restraint. There was a quote, and I couldn't find it exactly in the form that I was thinking of, so I'm going to just paraphrase it. But it was the idea that you get a better idea of what true power is. Not by the person that has power executing his power unabashedly over all the people around him. But that a person that has true power demonstrates it by how they hold back and control their power within measure and reason. The idea being that a dictator, a bully, a villain has power and uses it, that uses the power to establish himself at the expense of crushing all around them. God has a power that is above all else, but he demonstrates it not in how he crushes, but in how he restrains and gives chances and forgives and restores and redeems. The fact that all of us get to sit here, the fact that all of us get to watch this and have ex experience forgiveness and redemption and salvation is a reminder of how God is gracious. This story is also a testimony of God's patience. It's patient in dealing with us and with Pharaoh. It reminds us of the fact that, that we know what he wants. He wants to be known. We know that what he wants, he will have. And he could have had it at the beginning. He could, have sent Pharaoh, he could have sent Moses there once. Let my people go. No. And he could have done some other miraculous sign. They would have just got it done in an instant. But out of his patience and out of the bigger goals, he takes his time to try to work with those around him. This is tremendously encouraging but it, because it means that Although Pharaoh, we know, doesn't actually turn and experiences great consequence, you and me, 
still have the ability to do so. Where God has been pursuing you, where God has been revealing himself to you, where God has been calling you, and you have either, like Pharaoh, stubbornly not chosen to turn, or you've been afraid to, or you felt guilt and shame not letting you move on, whatever it is, we're reminded that God is powerful, but he is gracious, and he is patient, and he is pursuing and calling you. There is still time. Even in the darkest of times, there is time. The book of Joel is a slightly terrifying book, but also a very encouraging book. And in the midst of all the judgment that it speaks of, because of the sins of the people, we come across this verse in Joel 2.13. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate. He is slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Obviously, it's all speculation. And no scholar, no Bible teacher would or should say anything different other than it's speculation. But when I read this, I can't help but wonder, what if Pharaoh had chosen? To say, you know what? I know Pharaoh is God. We all are God, but based on the evidence of what I've seen, I'm going to be open to possibilities here. I'm going to let Israel go. This Lord, this Adonai, has really shown up and done some things. Maybe it's not too late. I have many a time fallen upon the words of Joel in my despair, in my struggle, in my disobedience, in my falling short, in my storms, when things around me aren't going well, and I need God, when I need a sign, when I need a reminder, I often fall to this. Remember, you know what? It's never too late. God is loving. He is gracious. Like our reference later in 2 Peter verse 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That is the Lord's heart. God must deal with sin. He must deal with Pharaoh and Egypt. He has to. And he has to show his power so the signs that he uses are terrifying. But even then, even now, he is patient, and he is gracious, and he is loving. He does not want anyone to perish. Nobody, no, zero. So he continues to extend a hand. He continues to reveal himself. He continues to use signs. But we have to know how are we responding. And I want to close by asking this question. Not just how are we responding, but what are we testifying to? So if we're watching this and we're here, like I said, we must have already responded enough that we are willing to listen, to open, to hear from God. So in our response, what are we testifying to by our actions, our words, and our thoughts? And this is what I mean. I'm not saying any of you or me are called to like, you know, pick up a megaphone, go downtown, stand in a corner, and start testifying to the works of God. Now listen, if you feel so led, God speed and go with you, um, but I, that's not what I'm saying. What I want us to consider is on our daily basis, in our jobs, in our families, in our neighborhoods, our kids' schools, what are we testifying to? And think about it this way. When people see us, do the, does their soul feel encouraged because, oh, here comes a person that is positive or encouraging or has a good outlook in life. Here is a person who, though they've gone through difficult things, seems to have a hope, seems to have a strength, seems to have a joy that I don't quite understand, but there seems to be something. Or do they see a person, or when they see us coming, do they see, oh, here comes that grumbler. Or, oh, man, they're, they're going to complain. Every time they're on, they just complain. Now listen, I am not passing judgment. I ask that of myself. And I am not saying that at times our life will not get difficult and we won't complain or we won't lament or there won't times that we will grumble or that we will be upset. I am just saying there is a difference between a momentary struggle where we voice that because it's important versus having walking around in an attitude and in a heart state of always complaining, always being hopeless, not testifying to the power, the grace, and the love 
of God who is enacting and living within us, around us, in our life. If we have the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, alive and dwelling in us, then that should overall remind us of the power, the grace, patience, and love of God. So how are we responding and what are we testifying to? I would ask you that as, again, as we close, as we sing our last song, and as you leave today, maybe talk to your spouse or your, your housemates or your close friend, somebody that would know you, and say, what, why don't we, what I want to hang out. And you can ask it however you want. You can be silly, you can be funny, but you can ask, when I want to hang out, when I, want to, when I say I want to talk, do you, are you open and excited or happy about it? Or are you going to like, ugh. Look, I'm going to be honest. I've had seasons in my life and I've had people in my life that if I were to be honest and we were kind of just, just laying it all out there, they'd be like, yeah, I, I wasn't too excited to have you call. <laughs> all of us at times can fall into the trappings where we testify about not things that aren't true, but things that are not the most significant and important things in our life. Is there pain? Is there struggle? Is there suffering? Is there difficulty? Of course. But for the believer, for the Christian, at every moment and every day, we can testify to certain things, either signs and wonders that we have experienced and seen, or the truth of Scripture. We can testify to the fact that in all things, at all times, our God is all-powerful, gracious, patient, loving, and kind. He longs for all to be saved. He relents on sending calamity and judgment whenever he can, always willing to forgive. How are we responding to that power? How are we responding to that grace and to that love? What do we testify to in our life? Again, like last week, are we responding like Pharaoh or are we responding like the Israelites, like Moses? There is hope, there is love, there is truth, there is joy. At all times available, God is powerful, loving, kind, gracious, and patient. He is working marvelous signs to remind us all. Are we seeing them? Are we willing to testify? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the fact that that is who you are. I thank you for the fact that even when I don't feel it, even when I don't see it, even though my life is not full of miraculous movements of birds and animals or darkening skies, which I'm kind of glad because those are kind of terrifying, but I am glad that there is just as much evidence, there, is just, there are just as many signs and wonders of your goodness, of your love, of your provision, of your power, of your forgiveness, of your grace, of your sovereignty all around me, in nature, in the people I interact with, in the things that I read about, in books, in articles, in the songs that we sing to praise you, in your word, in the movement of your spirit. There are reminders everywhere to the fact that there is one true God and that one God is all powerful that what he wants will happen it will be accomplished nothing can deter it and that in that power there is also an infinite amount of grace and patience that you desire that not one person would be lost and that all would be saved that you are a God that longs to forgive and has made forgiveness available to all of us so that we may be redeemed and restored into the right relationship with you and that you have done this out of your unfailing, abounding, limitless love. Lord, may we remember that. And in remembering it, may we be encouraged. And may that encouragement and that truth shape our very essence. So that our, our countenance, our expressions, our thoughts, our words, and our actions will not display a fake sense of joy and stability but one rooted in the truth of Scripture, that we will testify in how we live and who we are, that though things may be difficult, though things may be hard, you are still God. 
You are still on the throne. You are still in control. And what you want will happen. And nothing can stop you. And you are powerful. And you are loving. And you are patient. Lord, help us to remind us, encourage us, and help us to testify. May we respond in appropriate ways, in repentance, in worship, in, in, in praise, in obedience. For you are God, and we long to please you. Thank you, Lord. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Can you stand with us as we thank God for his love? Said you will hear me and you will you will hear the what I think God is trying to say to us. I don't want you walking away today thinking, man, if I'm not out there happy-go-lucky testifying about how good God is all the time, 
to everybody I meet, then I'm somehow failing or falling short. It's, it's not about performance. It's not about meeting your Jesus joy quota for the day or something. But it's about the fact that the enemy would love nothing more than to keep our eyes and our hearts, our minds, everything focused on that which is difficult, that which is painful, which, whether it be around us or in ourselves, our past, our choices, our shame, our struggle. The devil would like nothing more than to keep us focused on those things, which inevitably affect how we feel, how we think, how we act, how we speak. And God doesn't want to ignore those things. But God wants to remind you that he's dealing with those things, that he's paid for the sin, that he's made a way, that he is more powerful than our past and our current circumstances, that he loves and wants to see you through it, guide and direct. That in him there is eternal hope, there is forgiveness, there is love, there is purpose, there is joy. And that that truth, in the face of whatever else is going on, will be the thing we focus on most. So that it carries us, sustains us through the circumstances of our life. We all have signs and wonders and reminders in our life. And if you don't, that's part of the testifying. Listen to each other's stories, share with each other. What has God done in your life? What has God done in my life recently? Let those be signs to each other as we persevere and push on for the glory of God. We're going to close today as we do every week by reciting the Lord's Prayer. And again, we do this as a way of centering our hearts and minds on that which matters to God, a reminder of who, what God's heart is about as we recite the words that Jesus taught his very disciples to pray. So I invite you to join us as we pray together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week.